Good morning. Um, I'm so blessed to be here with you this morning. Um, my name is Kim Andrasky. Thank you, Keith, for introducing me. And I'm here to share with you a talk that I've titled, God is Real, Eyewitness Testimony of a Former Atheist. Before we get started, let me open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, there is no good thing that I can do apart from you. Lord, it is all from you and to you and through you, Lord. Let all the glory go to Jesus. Father, it is by your grace and I'm standing here. Father, I lift up every man, woman, and child that you've brought here and pray, Father, that if any of them do not know you as their Lord and their Savior, Father, I pray that today would be the day. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I'm a native of Des Moines, Iowa. I moved to the Memphis, Tennessee area about 10 years ago and now make my home in um, a little town called Barton, Mississippi, just south of the um, Tennessee border. We have um, four children, two daughters, ages 21 and 13, and two sons, ages 18 and 9. I grew up in a very legal family. My dad is a lawyer. My grandfather is a lawyer. My mom was actually my dad's legal assistant. Our dinner conversations generally revolved around whatever court case my parents were working on at that moment. And with that in mind, I encourage you to meet with me in a court of law as I come to you as a witness to testify that God is absolutely real. Like Peter and John, before the Jewish council in Acts chapter 4, I cannot but speak of what I have seen and heard. As the title of my talk referred to, I was an atheist before coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Several years ago, there was a big rally in Washington, D.C. for atheists. It was called the Reason Rally. I would have been there. I was a committed atheist and loved to tell other people about how foolish it was to become a Christian or to be a Christian. After becoming a follower of Christ, I was looking for some kind of term to use for who I was, and I came up with the term evangelical atheist, which seems strange to people because most people think of evangelical as being religious. But actually, the term evangelize means to advocate a cause for the purpose of making converts. That's absolutely what I was doing. I was as passionate about converting people to atheism as some of you would be to convert people to become a Christian. An atheist is one who denies the existence of God. So yes, that's what I was. I was trying to convert people to become an atheist like me. I wish that I could understand why I was so passionate about this. I wish that I had some kind of higher calling. I thought that, you know, I really loved people and I really wanted for their good. But ultimately, it was largely selfish. I I felt good about myself when I could show off to other people. When they looked foolish, it made me feel good about myself. Sadly, um, most of the Christians that I knew didn't seem to really care about my heart. They were mostly interested in my external appearance. They wanted me to quit cussing. They wanted me to quit wearing mini skirts and sleeping with my boyfriend. But it didn't seem to me like their interest was really in my eternal destiny and my heart. Growing up, my parents um, taught me to be good and kind, to um, be loving, to be diligent. I was an excellent student. I excelled at school. They had both grown up in Christian homes, but um, as far as I could tell, we were all just making up our own rules. And honestly, I really liked making up rules. I liked making up rules for myself because then I could keep them. I would make up rules that then I would enforce them upon myself to study or to, you know, do some good thing. And then um, it made, it continued to fuel my pride. In my daily life, I didn't really think very much about God. Honestly, the times when I thought about God were largely when it came to debating with people that were Christians, or when I thought about death, or when I saw the beauty of creation. I was terrified of dying. 
I remember being about eight or nine years old, and I was at my grandmother's house and laying in bed and thinking about what it would be like to die, to be laid in an empty crave. I believed that this life was all that I had, so I lived constantly in fear that I might die. I didn't like roller coasters. I always wore my seatbelt. I didn't want to ride on a, mo on a motorcycle. Anything that might potentially end my life, I was terrified of. This fear fed all the more my addiction to making rules. Some people might think that all atheists are immoral people. On my end, I chose to follow a more moral path. I was an outspoken non-drinker, non-smoker, non-drug doer, all because I was afraid that they would shorten my life. I was not um, afraid of sin. I didn't really know what sin meant, and that was not my issue. The other thing that really made me think about God was creation. And I remember being in high school. I was actually in Vermont at a debate camp, and I was laying in this um, big grassy field all by myself, uh, the breeze blowing, the blue sky over me, and I was thinking about God and thinking, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And the crazy thing was, he was showing himself to me. Romans 1.20 tells us that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. God was showing himself to me, but I couldn't see it. Even him prompting me to cry out to him was him calling to me. After graduating from high school, I went away to an incredibly small college in Illinois to earn a teaching degree. By this point, I truly was an outspoken, evangelical, angry atheist. I'm really looking forward to what Alex has to share with us about college life, because I was the one that you wouldn't want your kids to meet. I quickly met this really cool football jock, and we dated all four years of college. It was a terrible relationship, riddled with all kinds of terrible fights. Despite my misgivings, we got engaged shortly before my senior year. I was on the track to get married when I graduated from college. But my very last quarter of school, right before graduation, I was offered an opportunity to student teach a couple hours away in St. Louis. This was the opportunity that I needed to break it off with my boyfriend and move away. I gave him back his engagement ring and left a wedding gown and boxes of wedding invitations in my dorm room and left, hoping that this distance would make it easier for me. And for the first time in my life, I was completely and utterly alone. I felt hopeless, abandoned, depressed. I didn't know God or believe in him. And I had no idea that God was about to work in the midst of this loneliness to bring me to him. Shortly after arriving in St. Louis, a girlfriend who I'd known in college but who had moved away to a different school called me on the phone. I was pulled out of teaching to take her phone call. She announced to me that she was getting married the next day. Interestingly, I do confess to you that I had actually gotten her wedding invitation, but I didn't want to go. I'd just broken off an engagement. I was not interested in going to this wedding. But because she called me, well, how could I get out of it? I had to go. So, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll be there. Can you guess where she was getting married? In St. Louis. I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. I was going to school in Illinois. I am in St. Louis for all of eight weeks, and that's where she's getting married. So the next day, I attended this wedding, and it was the beginning of the change in my life. At this wedding, I met a man named Bill. Bill cared for me in a way that no other man ever had, and honestly, no other Christian ever had. Bill looked past my glaring external sins, and he saw my internal need for a savior. Bill did not allow his fears of debating with me 
You guys, I had debated all through high school. My parents were attorneys. I can argue somebody, even though I had no idea what I was talking about, man, I could argue really well. And Bill was a, a naive, he had attended a Baptist university. He had grown up in a Christian home. He was ill-equipped to debate me, and yet he wanted me to know Jesus, and he was willing to put himself out there to talk to me night after night. So after two weeks of debates, um, he used this word saved for like the dozenth time, and I honestly had no idea what this word meant. I know that in the Christian culture, there are a lot of words that people just know what they mean because other Christians know what they mean. I didn't know what I was being saved from. I had no idea what this word saved meant. So I said, so what does this mean to be saved? Isn't this what we all hope for, right? We all just wish, can't somebody just ask me how to be saved? So for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. I was 21 years old. I had grown up in the Midwest. I had attended church quite a few times with my grandparents. I was about to graduate the valedictorian of a small Methodist college in Illinois, and yet I had never understood that Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. I didn't know why he had died on the cross. I didn't know what Easter was about or what Christmas was about. These are things that people just assume that everyone knows, but no one had ever told me. I didn't know even the simple children's song, Jesus Loves Me. I remember after becoming a believer, there was one time when our church just stood up and we just sang Jesus Loves Me without the words on the screen, and I didn't know the song. I didn't know the famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In fact, I didn't know what the book of John was. When my now husband said, well, look in the book of John, I thought it was like a different book. I didn't realize that the Bible was made of books. I didn't know even basic children's Bible stories like Daniel and the Lion's Den or David and Goliath. I'll tell you that as soon as you have kids and you're in the church, of course you're expected to teach in Sunday school. I didn't know those children's Bible stories. You don't want me teaching them to your kids. Anyway, I learned right along with them. But at the same time, I will tell you, it is absolutely true that these things are spiritually discerned. And potentially, at some point, I had heard bits and pieces of things, but had been unable to understand them. So that night, for the first time, I heard that I was a sinner that Jesus' death had paid the penalty for my sin and that through faith in him, I could find forgiveness and peace and have eternal life and purpose. And that night with mustard seed sized faith, keep in mind, I knew next to nothing. And yet I prayed, God, if you are real, will you please save me? Please forgive me of my sins and grow my faith. And truly, I was born again that night. Not everything about me changed, but the Holy Spirit began to work in me in a way that it hadn't been possible before. I got a Bible, and I started reading the Bible, and it made sense to me in a way before that I would have just ridiculed people for believing in Noah. And now I believed it. It was the Holy Spirit at work in me. If any of you have not committed yourself to a life of service to Jesus, if you have not been born again, I pray that you would come talk to me, talk to Alex, talk to anyone here. Truly, God is real, and he does want you to know him. Which leads me into really the meat of my testimony, which is now me as an eyewitness to God as he worked before my eyes. Interestingly, as an atheist, I really didn't believe in anything that I couldn't see, hear, taste, touch, could not be proved to me beyond a reasonable doubt. I wanted to believe only in the physical things of the world, like the disciple Thomas, as described in John chapter 20. 
Thomas said that he would never believe unless he saw Jesus alive with his own eyes and touched his scars with his own hands. Thomas refused to believe the eyewitness accounts of other disciples who had seen Jesus with their own eyes. And Jesus, in his goodness, did appear to Thomas and invited him to see and touch. John chapter 20 ends with these three verses. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, I'm not speaking to you as an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. I have not been blessed like Thomas to see the risen Lord with my own eyes or to place my hand in his wounded side. And yet God has appeared to me in so many miraculous ways that I know without a doubt that God is real. And I just want to be here as his faithful witness to be a good steward of the testimony that he's given to me. So in April of 1994, after submitting myself to Jesus as my Lord and Savior, my life was radically transformed. Without any effort on my part, my entire value system began to change. And I went from being a ill-prepared evangelical atheist to being an ill-prepared evangelical Christian. (laughs) And in December of that same year, Bill and I were married. Six months later, we got pregnant for the first time and had a miscarriage. And then we had a beautiful baby girl, Emily, born in 1996. I had a tremendous need to share my joy with everyone that I met, but especially my best friend in the whole world, my sister Kristen. Kristen would have called herself more of an agnostic rather than an atheist. Kristen had been a um, philosophy major in college. She was really interested in different kinds of religion. The two of us spent hours on the phone, and so it was only logical that we would start talking about Jesus. I challenged her to pursue the reasonableness of Christianity, and she began reading several Christian apologetics books, including Evidence that Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. My sister Kristen and her husband Chad had moved from Denver out to a large working farm in rural Colorado. They had one young son, Brady, who is three months older than our oldest daughter, Emily. For Valentine's Day, I gave Kristen a Bible, and so she began reading it a little bit. A few months later, on May the 4th of 1997, her second son, Matthew Tyler, was born. She and her husband, Chad, had chosen the name Matthew intentionally because it means gift from God, which seemed really strange to me because my sister still did not believe in God. But that truly was why she picked the name. The day after Matthew was born, they came home from the hospital. Kristen and our mom, Mary, were back in little Brady's bedroom, sorting through baby clothes, getting ready for the new baby. Brady was outside with Chad and our dad. They were going to fix a windmill, when in the blink of an eye, everything changed. Little blonde-haired, blue-eyed Brady was accidentally run over when Chad pulled his truck out of the shop. And this precious little boy died there in front of the house while my sister held him frantically trying to do CPR, but to no avail. And as unimaginably painful as this is to even speak, little newborn Matthew truly was a gift from God. He forced all of us to keep going, especially my sister and her husband. And as I observed the aftermath of this tragedy from afar, it was incredible in how many ways God was working. Kristen and Chad had just moved out to this farm, just a mile outside of a tiny town of 300 called Crook, Colorado. They didn't know anyone there. 
For Easter, they had attended a church service with their little boy, and now they needed a place to perform a funeral service. So, of course, they went back to that church and asked if they would be willing to to do the funeral. And it turns out that this pastor of this tiny church had lost their firstborn son as a toddler when his wife was pregnant with their second child. Another dilemma that Kristen and Chad faced was where to bury Brady's body. There was actually a little family cemetery right there on their farm where they wanted to bury him, but there are certain rules and regulations you have to follow to get get that cemetery open for him to be buried there. Time was short, and they didn't know how to get permission to have um, to get permission to bury him there. Meanwhile, my sister, my mom had driven into town about 30 or 40 minutes away to go to a dry cleaner because my dad needed his suit dry cleaned. My mom ends up mentioning to him, well, we have a funeral coming up and, you know, we need you to get the suit dry cleaned. The gentleman behind the counter asked if the funeral was for that little boy out in Crook, to which my mom responded, yes, you know, it is. He said, would that family like to bury him in that cemetery? As it turned out, that was the dry cleaner's family plot. The elderly gentleman worked quickly to obtain permission from his siblings, and my sister was able to bury bury Brady there on their farm. After Brady's death, my sister and her husband began attending that little church in Crook, And my sister was amazed that every sermon seemed like it was speaking right to her. A few months after Brady's death, my sister thought, hey, I wonder what Matthew 5, 4 means. You see, Matthew had been born on May the 4th. His name's Matthew. He's born in the fifth month on the fourth day. Are you with me? This is just like a weird little thing that occurred to her. And as crazy as this might sound to some of you, and, and honestly, it is a little crazy, and yet God had a message there in his living and active word for this brokenhearted young mother. Matthew 5, 4 reads, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that precious little gift from God, Matthew Tyler, had been born on precisely the right day. God had known the number of Brady's days, and God had blessed them with a precious gift to be born in his perfect timing. Can anyone really call this luck, coincidence, random chance? And later that year, my sister committed her life to Jesus as her Lord and Savior, And we celebrated that out of such unspeakable pain that God had borne great fruit. In my own life, this series of events really encouraged me to trust God in a way that I hadn't before. In Job 42.5, Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. It's like what Alex was talking about yesterday. There are a lot of Christians that have a lot of head knowledge about God, and yet they are not really living like God is real. Now, if you have your Bibles with with you, you can open them to Hebrews chapter 11, which many refer to as the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 begins in verse 1 by defining faith for us. We read that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things that are not seen. This is a perfect definition of faith. Faith is being sure of the things that we hope for, being convicted of the things that we cannot see, of the invisible God. Remember the struggle of the disciple Thomas who wanted to see and touch Jesus. Remember my struggles as an atheist, refusing to believe in what I could not see and hear and touch. Faith is being sure, even when we cannot literally see with our own eyes. 
Then in verse 2, we read that by it, by faith, the people of of old received their commendation. And thus began, it begins a a beautiful chapter about the faithful obedience of Abel and Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Moses, as well as Sarah and Rahab and many more. All of these famous men and women of the Old Testament that many of you grew up hearing stories about, they were commended for their faith. They were blessed by God for their faith. When you skip forward to verse 6, you could write this down, you could highlight it in your Bible, you can highlight it in your iPhone. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. That is, God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I'm afraid that many of us are trying to please God in ways apart from our own faith. We're trying to please God by keeping the rules, by being nice, by reading our Bible and praying, and yet not pleasing him by our faith. The year after Matthew's birth and Brady's death, after being married for four years and having this beautiful little two-year-old daughter, God led our own family through our own painful series of circumstances. First off, my husband was miserable at his job to the point where I actually prayed for him to lose it. I don't know why I did this, but I did. And that day, when Bill called me saying he had been laid off, he was shocked by how at peace I was. He was not pleased, I must confess, when I told him that I had prayed for that. And yet, I knew that God's hand was all over this. God had really been working in my heart and had been growing my faith and encouraging me to seek him. I knew that God existed and that he was real, and I knew that he would reward us with Jesus as I sought him. So during Bill's couple months of unemployment, we became pregnant. I was both thrilled and nervous when I found out we were expecting again. Thankfully, by the time we found out, Bill had been offered a new job and was working towards getting insurance and so forth. When I was 12 weeks along, we went in for just your routine ultrasound. I had had a miscarriage before, and I confess I was kind of anxious about this ultrasound. The moment I saw the image on the screen, I knew that something was wrong. There was a huge bubble inside of my baby's belly. Already, this tiny little boy's bladder was larger than his head and my amniotic fluid was dangerously low. As it turned out, our unborn son, Tommy, had a condition called posterior urethral valves, which prevented him from passing urine. The doctors presented us with three options. First, we could terminate the pregnancy. That's nice words for abort the baby. Second, we could do nothing and wait until he was born, at which point, with 99% certainty, he would die. Or third, this is the third option, we could try in utero surgery to correct the condition. Truly, why do they present you with these three options? If this was my two-year-old daughter being diagnosed with cancer, would they have given me three options? You can kill her now, you can do nothing and wait for her to die, or you can try cancer treatment. Needless to say, my response was, how soon can you schedule the surgery? So about two weeks later, two very long weeks later, the surgery was attempted, but they were unsuccessful. They were unable to drain his bladder. And I went home for a very long weekend to see what would happen to my little boy. On Monday, I returned to the hospital and learned that Tommy had passed away over the weekend. As you might imagine, I was heartbroken. And yet, once again, I knew that God was real and that he was at work. You know, just before the surgery, on my way into the hospital, I had prayed, God, would you please either heal him or take him quickly? The idea of continuing for five more months of a long pregnancy to have him pass was heartbreaking to me. 
I found myself in a very difficult position because to the people around me, I just had a miscarriage and I was going to move on. And yet, through a series of other complications following his birth, I became incredibly depressed. I desperately wanted another baby, and yet I could not imagine the pain of getting pregnant again. Before Bill and I were even married, we had discussed having two biological children and then adopting the rest, and now seemed like the perfect time. So the day after Tommy's due date had passed, we filed our very first piece of paperwork to begin the long process of adoption. To my utter disbelief, three months later, we got the call that there was a baby boy in Russia ready for us to adopt. This was way too fast. Nine months is a normal pregnancy. Three months was really quick. Three weeks later, full of joy and fear, we flew halfway around the world to meet this darling little boy who one quick month later became our forever son. In hindsight, once again, there were so many ways that God confirmed his hand upon this adoption. Nick was born the very week that my husband and I began praying for a little boy. I have my journal and it is so sweet to see, here it is, he's being born and I don't even know it. By no coincidence, Bill was, um, Bill's dad was born on the very same day as our son, Nick. And our soon-to-be son, who we had named Nicholas, turned out to be a Christmas baby. He was born on the day when Russians celebrate Christmas. This precious baby boy, who had been born halfway around the world, had been chosen to be our little man. My son, Nick, is an absolutely precious gift to us. I cannot imagine life without him. Two years after bringing Nick home, God had really healed my heart, and I began to yearn for another baby. And yet my husband, Bill, was content with our two. So I once again began to pray. This time I'm praying specifically for the Lord to either bless us with another child or close my womb. I know I'm a slow learner, these things that I keep praying. And yet, once again, God did answer my prayer, but he literally closed my womb. When Nick was about three years old, I had a routine doctor's appointment where I was diagnosed with precancerous cells on my cervix. I had a laser procedure done to remove them. I developed a condition called cervical stenosis, where your cervix literally heals closed. After six months of not having a menstrual cycle, I finally went into the doctor, and they had to do another procedure to reopen it. The following month, though, I found myself lying in bed in excruciating pain, I remember laying there praying, please, Lord, please. And my period started for the first time in over half a year. And yet, my husband was still not interested in having more children. So I changed my prayer, began to pray instead for the Lord to either change me to not want another child or to give my husband a desire for another baby. I really didn't want to get pregnant against my husband's wishes. And the Lord once again blessed my prayer of faith. He brought a little baby in need of short-term foster care into our home. Mackenzie Love was only in our home for a week, and yet the Lord used her to give Bill a desire to add to our family. Incredibly, we got pregnant three months later, and after two years of waiting and wishing for another child, the Lord blessed me with another Christmas baby, Noelle Grace born exactly one year after Mackenzie. Because of the five-year age gap from Nick down to Noelle, I have frequently been asked if she was a surprise, to which I am able to joyfully respond, yes, absolutely she was a surprise, but not how you think. She was a surprise after a dozen negative pregnancy tests, but this child was no accident. She is absolutely the gift of God and an answer to prayer. Noelle is a precious girl, and she brings light everywhere she goes. She's a faithful friend and a cheerful spirit, and we give thanks for her. 
Two years after Noel's birth came another major test of our faith when Bill was once again laid off from work. I hadn't prayed for it this time. By this point, I was homeschooling Emily and Nick, and Noel was a toddler. After six months of searching for permanent employment, there was still no job in sight. Severance had run out, and Bill was doing temporary contract work, but it required him to travel weeks on end, and it didn't pay right away, so we were always waiting for when that money would come in. I wanted to sell our car, sell our house, sell any and all of our possessions just so I wouldn't have to go back to work, and Bill would not be gone for weeks on end. But I prayed, I sought the scriptures, I submitted myself to my husband, I asked other believers to pray for us, and asked God to show Bill what we should do so he could take the lead on this decision. In the end, Bill decided we should put our house on the market. The value of our house had appreciated considerably, and we thought we would use that um, extra money to buy a little house and stay in St. Louis. And yet, in the midst of a huge housing boom, our house stayed on the market for months. We continued to pray and watch as the Lord provided financially for us at just the right time. Finally, Bill made the hard decision that he was going to look outside of um, the St. Louis area. And we ended up in Memphis, Tennessee. This is when we learned the um, adage, God is rarely early, but he is never late. And I would put it in Southern, God is rarely early, but he ain't late. God is real. Let me close with just a little encouragement to you of what it means to be a witness. Over 20 years ago, when my old atheistic, blaspheming, God-hating self died, and my new God-loving self was born, I was blessed with this gift of faith. There are two basic things of being a witness. One is to see, and one is to tell. If you don't see anything, then you really can't be a witness. You have to see something, hear something, have her overheard something. But you can't just see it. You have to then tell someone about it. I'm afraid that too often we are either blind and not seeing God at work, or we are not faithfully telling other people what we have seen. If you'd like any more information, I do have um, an audio download of this on my website, or I'm recording it and I can send you a link. I put a little email, like you can register your email on this little clipboard up here. If anybody wants, I can send them a link to this. Um, My website is teachwhatisgood.com. I do blog very sporadically. If you're interested, I can add you to the list. I also wrote a book called A Child of Promise that's based on my story of continuing my pregnancy. It is um, part Bible study, part journaling, and part my own story. If anyone's interested, I have copies of that with me here. So let us close in prayer. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. All the glory to God the Father and to his Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.